Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at the Portland Public Library and I'm here today to continue our book that we've been reading, Dealing with Dragons by Patricia C. Reedy, the first book of the Enchanted Forest Chronicles published by Scholastic. So we're going to start uh, where we left off with chapter 11. The last thing that just happened is Alianora and Simmerine had finally gotten the fire spell, the fireproofing spell to work and um, Alianora had come to ask Simmerine for some more feverfew, the ingredient that activates the spell because she'd been using the spell quite a lot as she was nervous that her dragon, Warog, might um, accidentally blow fire on her. Um, as he's been very upset lately. Um, Cimmerine and Alianora went to go collect some and they found uh, the wizard Andrel, the son of the head of the Society of Wizards, lurking in a place that he shouldn't have been with a weird plant. Uh, but they did find out that um, the feverfew, which usually needs to be dried, works fresh, but it doesn't protect your uh, clothes when Samarine accidentally set her sleeve on fire. So we'll start with chapter 11 in which Kazul is unwell and Samarine makes a new acquaintance. Ali and Nori decided to re return home by way of the path outside instead of through the tunnels because it was such a nice day and she hoped the sun would dry her skirt. Samarine watched her go swinging her basket happily and humming a little her confidence and good humor completely restored by the possession of the fat little packet of dried feverfew in her pocket. I wish I had that little to worry about, Samarine muttered, thinking of Warog and the wizards. She held the burned patch at the end of her sleeve up to get a better look at it in the sunlight and shook her head. Even the magic wardrobe would have a hard time fixing that. A puff of wind made her shiver in her wet clothes and she turned to go back into the cave to change. A dark shadow fell over Samarine and she stopped and looked up. Kazul, she said, as the dragon landed on the open path beside her. I'm glad to see you. Wait till you hear what's been happening. You do appear to have had a rather strenuous day, Kazul said, eyeing Samarine's wet stained skirt and the blackened end of her right sleeve. Nothing serious, I trust. I'm not sure, Samarine said. Alianor and I went to pick out some fever few, and we ran into the wizard Antarell. Where was this? Simmerine pointed. Up that way. There's a little round valley off to one side that looks as if the dragons never go there, and... You found a wizard there? Kazul sounded deeply disturbed. How did he get in? How did you get in? We climbed through a crack in a boulder, Simmerine said. I don't know how Antorel did it. When we he left, he was headed for the far side of the valley. This is serious, Kazul said, getting to her feet. I'd better warn the king. He'll have to use the crystal now. You'd better hear the rest of it first, Simmerine said. Andral wasn't too happy to see us, but when he found out that Alianora was Warog's princess, he relaxed. He seemed to think that Warog had sent us. What? Simmerine involuntarily stepped back a pace at the anger in Kazul's voice. He thought Warog had sent us, she repeated, and gave a quick summary of her conversation with Andral. Warog! Kazul's tail lashed, sweeping a small boulder from one side of the path to the other. But Warog's not a fool, and only a fool would let a wizard into that valley. Unless he was sure that they didn't know. Well, what was Andrell doing? Cutting plants, Cimmerian said. Or rather, cutting a plant. It didn't look as if he took more than one. He wouldn't need more than one if it was the right one, Kazul said tensely. What did he pick? It was a prickly-looking purple thing with saw-edged leaves, Simmerine said, reaching into her pocket. I didn't recognize it, but I thought you might, so I brought a piece back for you to look. What? Kazul roared. Flames spurted from the dragon's mouth, enveloping Simmerine. Steam hissed from her wet skirt, and the thinner material of her sleeve vanished in a crackle of sparks. The handkerchief-wrapped spray of purple leaves, which she had just taken out of her pocket to show Kazul, disintegrated into a dark, greasy-looking cloud of smoke. Simmerine stared at the ashes in her palm, feeling very, very glad that she had decided to test the fresh few for few for the fireproofing spell. She felt a little warm, and her clothes had been reduced by a few, to a few charred rags, but that was nothing compared to what might have happened. Now I understand why Eleonora ran out of fever few, she muttered. A puff of wind brushed Simmerine's arms, and she heard a choking sound from Kazul. 
She looked up, expecting to find the dragon laughing at her remark, and her eyes widened. Kazool's head was thrown back and her mouth was wide open, giving Simarine an excellent view of the dragon's sharp silver teeth and long red tongue. Simarine skipped backwards out of reach, and then she realized that the dragon was gasping for air. Kazool, what's the matter? <coughs> the smoke! <coughs> Kazool coughed. Her voice was so hoarse that it was hard for Simarine to understand what she was saying. What can I do? Simarine asked, trying not to feel frightened. Green jar! Shelf in the last treasure room! Kazool managed between coughs. Hurry! Simarine was already running through the mouth of the cave as fast as her feet could carry her. She did not even pause as she snatched up her lamp from the floor just inside the door. It seemed to take forever to get through the twisty passages and the first two caves full of treasure. She skidded to a halt in the doorway of the third room and stood panning, scanning the walls for the shelf in the right jar. She found it quickly and ran back at once, the jar clutched tightly in her right hand. The sound of Kazool's coughing grew louder as Simarine sped back the way she had come. At the mouth of the cave, Simarine paused and set down the lamp, then unscrewed the top of the green jar. Inside was a thick emerald-colored liquid about the consistency of honey. She looked at Kazool. The dragon's head jerked with each cough, and the scales on the edge of her neck were beginning to turn pink around the edges. For a long, careful moment, Simarine studied Kazool's movements. Then she leaned back and threw the emerald liquid, jar and all, into the dragon's open mouth just as Kazool took another gasping breath. The jar landed on Kazool's tongue. The dragon's mouth closed and she swallowed convulsively. Sudden silence descended. Are you all right now? Simarine asked after Kazool had taken several deep breaths without a renewed bout of coughing. I will be, Kazool said. She sounded exhausted and her movements as she slid into the cave were slow and uncertain. What happened? Simarine asked, backing out of the way so that Kazool would not have to exert herself to go around. I got a breath of the smoke when the plant in your hand burned, Kazool said as she settled into the floor just inside the entrance. Luckily, it was only a breath. I'll need a few days of rest, but it's better than being dead. Simarine stared at her, appalled. What was that plant? Dragon's bane, Kazool said, and her eyes closed and she slept. Kazool continued to sleep for the most of the next three days. She woke only long enough for Simarine to pour a couple gallons of warm milk mixed with honey down her throat from time to time before she lapsed back into unconsciousness. Simarine was very worried, but there wasn't much she could do. Sick dragons are too large and heavy for normal nursing to be much of a use. On the afternoon of the third day, Kazul woke up completely for the first time since her collapse. Thank goodness, said Simarine as Kazul shook her head experimentally and sat up. I was beginning to think that you were going to sleep for a month. I might have if I'd gotten more than a whiff of that smoke, Kazool said, stretching her neck in one direction and her tail in the other, trying to work some kinks out of her back. If I'd known it was so dangerous, I never would have brought any of that purple plant back with me. Serene apologized. You might have done worse than sleep for a month. You might have... She stopped, unwilling to complete the thought. I might have died, Kazool said. Unlikely. If a dragon isn't killed outright by something in the first five minutes, recovery is only a matter of time. That applies as much to Dragon's Bane as it, as it does to a knight's magic sword. Then why did you want that goo and the green jar? Simarine asked. The antidote? I wanted it because I didn't like the idea of spending a month recuperating when I didn't have to. And since... A fit of coughing interrupted Kazool mid-sentence. Simarine skipped backwards out of the way. Frowning worriedly, she tossed a pinch of fever few into the air and recited the verse from a fireproofing spell in case Kazool should lose control of her flame again. Maybe you won't need a month to recover, but three days obviously isn't enough, she said to the dragon. You better lie back down before you choke. I can't, Kazool said. I have to warn the king. If the wizards have had dragon's vein for three days already. She started coughing again and had to stop talking. You stay here, Simarine said in a firm tone. I'll warn the king. Tokos won't listen to you, Kazul said, but she did settle back to the ground. Roxim will, though. Start with him. Roxim? Simarine said doubtfully. She was afraid the green-gray dragon would want to go charging after the wizards as soon as he heard that they were up to something. He'll listen to you, and the king will listen to him, Kazul said. It's not ideal, but it's the best we can do. All right, I'll go see Roxim. You stay here and sleep. When you get back... I will wake you and tell you what he said, Simarine promised. Now go to sleep. 
The Marine smiled slightly and closed her eyes. Kazool smiled slightly and closed her eyes. Samarine caught up a lamp and almost ran to the exit at the back of the cave. She was afraid that Kazool would think of something else and start talking again, and she didn't think it would be good for her. In the tunnel outside, Samarine paused, trying to remember the directions to Roxine's cave. She had memorized a map in the library that showed the twists and turns of the dragon caves, um, but she knew from experience that in the miles of gray stone corridors, it was difficult to keep track of where she was. Left, left, fifth right, past a little chamber, right again, past the iron gate, two left to the third cave down, she muttered to herself. I wish Roxine's caves were closer. Still muttering, she started off. Though she was being very careful, Simarine had to backtrack twice during the first part of her trip when a mistake in counting corridors led her down a dead end. When she finally saw the iron gate that led to the caves of fire and night, she sighed in relief. The tricky part was over and the rest of the trip would be easy. She held her lamp up and quickened her step, hoping to make some of the time, make up some of the time that she had lost on her detours. Then, as she reached the bars that blocked the entrance to the caves of fire and night, she stopped short. There was someone sitting on the ground on the other side of the gate. Simarine had almost missed seeing him, and no wonder. His clothes, though well cut, were the same dark gray as the stone of the tunnel walls, and he was curled into a lumpy ball. He looked dejected and like a large rock. If he hadn't moved his hand as she passed, Simarine would never have realized that he was alive. The man on the other side of the bars raised his head, and Simarine saw with a shock that his hair and skin were the same dark gray, even as gray as his clothes. His eyes, too, were gray, and their expression was apologetic. Forgive me for startling you, the man said, climbing ponderously to his feet. I didn't see you coming. He made a stiff, formal bow. Who are you? Simarine demanded. And what are you doing in there? I am a prince, the man said in a gloomy tone, and I'm reaping the rewards of my folly. What folly? The prince sighed. Oh, it's a long story. Somehow they always seem to be long, Simarine said. You haven't come to rescue me from the dragons, have you? Because if you have, I'm not going to let you out of here. I haven't got time to spend an hour arguing today. I have no interest whatsoever in dragons, I assure you, the prince said earnestly, and if you would let me out, I'd be extremely grateful. Um, who are you, by the way? Simarine, princess of the dragon Kazool, Simarine said. She studied the prince for a moment and then decided that he looked trustworthy. All right, I'll let you out. Turn around and put your fingers in your ears. What? The prince said, looking considerably startled. It's part of the spell to open the gate, Simarine said. She wasn't about to let him overhear the words that Kazool had used to unlock the door, even if he did look trustworthy. The prince shrugged and did as she directed. Quickly, Simarine recited, By night and flame and shining rock, open thou thy hidden lock, Aberolingarn. For an instant, nothing happened, and Simarine was afraid that she had not remembered the charm correctly. Then the iron gate swung open silently, and the prince, whose back was to the gate, did not notice. Simarine touched his shoulder to get his attention, and her eyes widened. Oh, she said as he turned around, your, your stone. I know, the prince said. It's part of that long story I mentioned earlier. I haven't got used to it yet. He stepped through the gate, and it closed noiselessly behind him. I'm afraid I don't have time to listen to stories just now, Simarine said politely. I have a rather urgent errand to run, so if you'll excuse me, can't I come with you? Simarine stared at him. Why do you want to do that? The stone prince looked at his feet with an embarrassed expression. Um, well, actually, I'm lost, and you seem to know your way around down here. He glanced hopefully at Simarine. I suppose I can just wander around some more. I'll have to find a way out eventually. You'll run into a dragon and get eaten. I don't think it will hurt stone, the prince said. He sounded almost cheerful, as if he'd only just realized that being made of stone might have some adva advantages. Maybe not, but you're sure to give the dragons indigestion, Simarine said. Bother, I don't have time for this. I could wait here if you're coming back this way, the stone prince suggested. So Simarine brightened, then frowned and shook her head. No, one of the dragons might need to get into the caves of fire at night. Or it might be the turn of those dratted wizards who can't stay here. Then, I know. You can wait in the serving room just off the banquet hall, Simarine said. It's close, there's plenty of room, and I know that no one's using it today because I checked the schedule for Alianora yesterday. I can take the shortcut out the back to get to Roxim's without losing any more time. Come on. 
I really appreciate this, the stone prince said as they started off. You don't know what it's like being lost in the dark in the caves. How did it happen? Samarine said. The stone prince's expression became gloomy once more. It's all that soothsayer's fault, he said. Soothsayer? My father didn't think it was appropriate to invite fairies to a prince's christening, so he invited a soothsayer instead, the prince replied. The soothsayer took one look at me and said that I would grow up to do a great service for a king, and I've been stuck with this blasted prophecy ever since. That doesn't sound so terrible to me, Submarine said. It wasn't at first, the stone prince admitted. I had special tutors and all sorts of interesting things to prepare me for being of great service to a king. My father even sent me to a special school for people who were supposed to do special things. Did you do well? I was the top of my class, the stone prince said with a flash of pride. His face fell again. That's part of the problem. I don't understand, Samarian said. This way. Can you walk a little faster, please? I'm in a hurry. It's been three years since I've graduated, and everyone's still waiting for me to do something spectacular, the stone prince said, lengthening his stride. The rest of my classmates are already making names for themselves. George started killing dragons right away, and Art went straight home and pulled some sort of magic sword out of a rock. Even the ones no one expected to do amount to much have done something. All Jack wanted to do was go back to his mother's farm and raise beans, and he ended up stealing a magic harp and killing a dragon, uh, killing a giant and all sorts of things. I'm the only one who hasn't succeeded. Why not? The stone prince sighed again. I don't know. At first it seemed as if I wouldn't have any trouble finding a king to serve. Every time there was a war, both kings asked me to lead their armies, and every king for miles around who'd lost his throne to a usurper sent a message to my father's court. It should have been simple. Only they were always so worried about whether I was going to side with their enemies that it was easier not to pick anyone. I see, Simrine said. Privately, she thought that the prince had been rather wishy-washy. Some of her opinion must have crept into her tone because the stone prince nodded glumly. You're right. It was a mistake. As long as I didn't pick a king to serve, all the messengers and ambassadors and envoys stayed hoping to persuade me. The inns around the castle were stuffed with them, and it got to the point where I couldn't show my face without at least three of them pouncing on me. Finally, I couldn't stand it anymore. I ran away. It was a relief at first, not having everyone hovering over me, wanting, waiting for me to do something great. But after a little while, I started to feel uncomfortable. Then I realized that if nobody around me expected me to do any, even if nobody around me expected me to do anything great in service of a king, I expected me to do something. I was so flustered that I ran up to the next palace I saw and asked whether the king needed any services done. It turned out that he was ill, and his doctors had told him that the only thing that would cure him was a drink of the water of healing from the caves of fire at night. So I left the edit at once. So that's what you were doing, Simmerine said. The stone prince gave her another gloomy nod. I should have known better. The king had three sons, and the first two had already gone off to get the water and failed. Anyone with sense would have seen that the youngest son was the one who would succeed. It sticks out all over. But I was too eager to do my great service and get it over with, and I didn't stop and think. What happened? It took me a long time to find the caves of fire at night, but once I did, it wasn't hard to find the water of healing. The chamber's getting crowded. All the princes who've tried to get the water and failed have been turned into slabs of rock. I know, said Simmerine. I've seen them. Watch out for your head here. The ceiling's low. Then you know what it's like, and you've seen the two dippers on the wall by the spring. The stone prince's shoulders sagged. I knew that I should have used the tim one. It's one of the first things that we learned in school. But I thought it wouldn't do any harm if I just looked at the gold one, so I took it off the wall, and as soon as I touched it, I started to, I started to stiffen up, um, said Simmerine. The stone prince was obviously well aware of how foolishly he'd behaved. She saw no reason to make him feel worse by pointing it out to him again. So I stuck my arm in the spring, the prince said. You stuck your arm? Oh, I see. That was clever, Simmerine said. Do you really think so? The stone prince asked anxiously. I thought that since the water from the spring is going to turn all the slabs of stone back into princess when someone finally succeeds at the quest, then the water ought to keep me from turning into a slab of stone in the first place. Only it didn't quite work the way that I expected. He finished disconsolately. Uh, I can see that, Simmerine said, but at least you can still do things. It would be much worse to have to lie there waiting for the right prince to come along and break the spell. I wouldn't have to lie there long, the stone prince said. That 
king's youngest son is going to arrive any day now. I just know. Anyway, if I were a slab of stone, I wouldn't know about it until it was all over, and I'd been turned back into a prince. How do you know? Samarine demanded. Have you ever been a stone a slab? A slab of stone? The prince looked startled. Oh, no, I haven't. I never thought of that. We'll start thinking now, Samarine said tartly. Here's the service room. Wait for me, and don't go wandering off if I'm late getting back. I don't know how long this errand is going to take, and it would be very awkward for me if the dragons found you roaming their tunnels. I'll remember, the stone prince promised, but what do I do if someone comes in? Duck into the banquet area, Samarine sh said, showing him, and if someone comes in there too, curl up in the corner and pretend you're a rock. All right, said the prince doubtfully. Samarine did not like leaving him, but she was even less enthusiastic about taking him to see Roxine. Roxane probably wouldn't object to the prince himself, though Simarine suspected that there might have been some difficulty over his proposed theft of the Water of Healing, but explaining everything to the green-gray dragon would take hours. Roxane was nice, but he tended to take a simple view of things, and the prince's situation was anything but simple. So Simarine gave the prince one more warning, just to be sure that he understood, and started off towards Roxane's cave to finish her errand. And now we're on chapter 12, which is called In Which Simmering Calls on a Dragon and the Stone Prince Discovers a Plot. The shortcut to rock seams worked as well as Simmering had hoped, and she even made up some of the time she had lost earlier. Roxine was in, too. She could hear the scraping of his scales as he moved around on the inside. She stepped up to the entrance of the cave and called, Dragon Roxine! Something round and shiny flew through the air, missing Simmering by inches. It hit the wall of the tunnel with a loud clang and slid rattling to the floor. Simarine jumped. Roxim! she shouted at the top of her lungs. Uh, what's this? The dragon said, poking his nose out of the cave entrance. I'm Simarine, princess to the dragon Kazul, and I offer you greetings and good fortune in all your endeavors. Simarine thought it was best to be particularly polite in case Roxim was in a bad mood. She suspected he might be. In her experience, someone in a good mood did not throw things at visitors. Uh, very good, Roxim said. Nice to see you again and all that, but I haven't got time for visitors at the moment. Sorry. I I'm not a visitor, exactly. Kazul sent me with a message for you. Oh, well, well, that's different. Just hand me that shield there, would you? Samarine picked up the shield from the floor of the tunnel. There was a large dent in one side where it had hit the tunnel wall and several smaller ones over the rest of it from banging against things on its way to the tunnel floor. You ought to be more careful, she said severely. Just look at this. Ha! Roxim started examining the dents. Shoddy work, shoddy work, that's the problem. In my day, you could roll a knight in full armor down the far side of the vanishing mountain, bounce him off two or three cliffs without so much as scratching the surface, much less denting it. This cheap modern stuff just doesn't hold up. If you know it doesn't hold up, you shouldn't throw it around like that, Submarine said. You almost hit me. Roxim shifted uncomfortably. Sorry, didn't mean anything by it. That's all right, but next time look before you throw things, Simrine said, handing him the shield. I always have this problem when I try to find something, Roxine confided. Never know where to look. It gets frustrating, and the next thing you know, I'm pitching armor at the walls. Bad habit, but hard to break. Maybe I could help, Simrine suggested, after I give you Kazul's message, that is. Don't need help to put dents in things, Roxine said. Come to, come to, come to that, I don't think I really want to dance and things. I didn't mean help to throw things, Simarine said patiently. I meant help finding whatever you're looking for. Simarine followed the dragon into a moderately large cave, similar to the one Kazul used as a living room. Roxim's cave, however, was full of clutter. Simarine had to pick her way past bits of armor, one half of a pair of bookends, a box of tea, a pink scroll, three mismatched kitchen pots, and a small wooden statue a broken flute, four partially burned candles, and a lot of other things. Roxim walked straight over the mess as if it weren't there, squashing a mangy-looking stuffed pigeon and flattening a tin cup in passing. He dropped the shield on a pile of silk flowers and waved at Simarine to sit on a large wooden chest near one wall. N now what's this message of Kazul's? It's about the wizards, Simarine said, settling gingerly onto the dusty surface of the chest. She made a mental note to find Roxim a nice princess as soon as she could. 
Ali and Aura and I found one of them picking dragon's bane a few days ago and Kazul thinks that King Tokes will listen to you if you tell him about it. So that's where they got it, Roxim said in tones of disgust. Pity you didn't mention it sooner. Simarine got a sinking feeling. What do you mean? Somebody poisoned King Tokes this morning, Roxim explained. Slipped some dragon's bane into his coffee. Fast acting, nothing to be done. Now we need a new king. That's awful, Simarine said. Do you know who did it? Those dratted wizards, that's who, Roxanne said angrily. It's obvious, stupid thing to do. Has to be wizards, by George. But Warag won't listen to me. Warag? What's Warag got to do with it? He's in charge of the investigation, Roxanne replied. Taking his time about it, too, if you ask me. But if the king was only poisoned this morning, what does that have to do with it? Roxanne said unreasonably. Besides, if Warag doesn't hurry, you won't have the culprit in hand by the time the trials start tomorrow. Trials? You mean with Colin Stone to choose a new king? Serene said with some hesitation. She did not see how it could be a trial for the person who had killed the king if they hadn't caught him yet. But she was not completely certain that the dragons didn't have some way of getting around that problem and trying him anyway. That's it, Roxanne said pleased. And before I leave, I have to find that emerald I picked up 50 years ago coronation present for the new king. But you, you haven't got a new king yet, Simarine said, feeling somewhat bewildered. And what if you're the king? Roxim smiled broadly. I knew you were a nice gal. Me, the king? I rather like the idea. I still have to find the emerald, though. Wouldn't you to show up for the trials without a coronation present? A rum thing to do, overconfident. Though she was upset and more than a little worried, Simarine did help Roxim as best she could. After about an hour of poking through the clutter, Simarine found the emerald wrapped in a gold embroidered handkerchief and stuffed into the mouth of a large brass horn. Roxim thanked her and, and invited her to stay to tea, but Simarine politely declined. She was eager to get back to Kazool to tell her what had happened and to decide what to do next. Simarine hurried back to Kazool's cave by the shortest route, thinking so hard about Tokaz's death that she forgot everything else. She found Kazul sleeping and was forced to wake her despite her worries about the dragon's health. She knew Kazul would want to know about the King of the Dragons as soon as possible, and she wanted to hear what Kazul made of Warag's involvement in the investigation. Back already, Kazul said, opening her eyes. Didn't Roxine get you in to see King Tokaz? No, Simarine said. She hesitated, uncertain of the best way to break the news. It was too late. Too late? Kazul raised her head, startled. She eyed Simarine briefly and then said, All right, let's have it. What happened? King Tokas was poisoned this morning. Roxim said that someone put dragon's bane in his coffee. Kazul snorted. Someone knew Tokas pretty well. Seeing Simarine's surprised expression, she explained, Tokas drank Turkish coffee every morning. The stuff is strong enough to take the roof off your mouth. That's why no one ever went to talk to him over breakfast. You could boil a whole field's worth of dragon's bane in Turkish coffee without changing the taste of it enough to notice, or the texture. Simarine tried to Im imagine coffee, even Turkish coffee, strong enough to take the roof off a dragon's mouth, and failed. I told Roxim about the wizard Alienor uh, and I met, and Roxim said I ought to tell Warug because Warug is in charge of finding the poisoner. But... When you caught Elian and Torrell, he was picking Dragon's Bane, and he thought that Warrug had sent you, Kazul said. If Warrug's messed up with the wizards, she broke off, coughing. Simarine watched her anxiously, but this coughing spasm did not last long. I don't like this, Kazul finished when she got her breath back. I don't either, Simarine agreed, but what can we do about it? Kazul frowned and said nothing. For several minutes, the two sat and thought in silence. Then Kazul said, we can't do anything until the new king has been chosen. Did Roxim say when the testing would be? Tomorrow, Simarine said. Tomorrow? Kazul surged to her feet. Why didn't you say so at once? If I'm to be at the fort of the Whispering Snakes tomorrow, I have to... Lie down, Simarine commanded. Kazul looked at her in surprise and collapsed in another fit of coughing. Simarine waited until the dragon's coughing had subsided and then said sternly, You're in no condition to go hauling rocks over the countryside. I'd be surprised if you can even fly as far as the end of the pass. I think you're going to have to give up on the trials this time around. Kazul made a choking noise. Simarine looked at her in alarm and then realized that the dragon was laughing. It's not optional, princess, Kazul said. All the adult dragons in the Mountain of Morning are required to show up, no matter what condition they're in. But... There is no acceptable excuse for missing the test of a new king, Pasul replied. None. 
and I have a great deal deal to do before I leave. So if you'll, if anything needs to be done around here, I'll do it. Simmering said firmly. If you don't rest, you won't be able to fly at all. And then how will you get to the Ford? A reasonable point, Kozul said, settling reluctantly back into place. Very well. The first thing I need is a coronation present for the new king. There's a jeweled helmet on the shelf in the second storeroom that might do. Bring it out so I can take a look for it. Simmering spent the rest of the evening running errands for Kazool. Besides choosing a coronation gift, Kazool rejected the helmet and two crowns before deciding on a scepter made of gold and crystal. Innumerable messages had to be delivered to various dragons who were in charge of arranging the trials. One had to be informed of Kazool's ill health so that it could be taken into account when the order of the testing is established. This one had to be told about Kazoo, that Kazool would not be able to join the coronation procession. Substitutes had to be found to perform Kazool's various ceremonial duties. Then their names had to be approved by a surly dragon in charge of protocol. And finally, the substitutions had to be recorded on the list of all the dragons who were managing each of the other events. It reminded Simmering strongly of Linderwall and her parents' court. By the time that the last arrangement had been made and the last message delivered, it was very late and Simmering was exhausted. She was also very glad that she had not let Kazool do all the running around. The dragon, who had slept most of the time that Simmering was out, was looking better, even in the dim light of Simmering's lamp. Tired but satisfied, Simmerin went to her room and dropped into bed. Simmerin was up early the next morning, stirring a dozen ostrich eggs into a large iron kettle for Kazool's breakfast. Kazool ate all of them and then slid out of the cave and prepared to leave for the fort of the Whispering Snakes. Don't fret, Princess, Kazool said. The testing doesn't start till ten. I have plenty of time to get there, even if I stop to rest now and again. Her voice sounded much better than it had the day before, and it no longer seemed to rasp in her throat. While I'm gone, why don't you visit Warog's Princess? See if she's noticed anything odd the last few days. We need to know as much as we can before we talk to the new king about Warog and the wizards. All right, Simrian said, as soon as I'm done with the dishes. Kazool turned and leapt into the air, her wings churning clouds of dust from the dry surface of the ground. Simrine squinted after her and shouted, Good luck! Kazool's wings dipped in answer before the dragon soared out of sight behind the shoulder of the next mountain. Simrine stood looking after Kazool, her forehead wrinkling in worry. After a moment, she shook herself and went inside. She had work to do. Washing the dishes did not take long, and as soon as that was done, Simrine set off to visit Ali and Aura. The tunnels and passages were silent and empty, and Simrine's footsteps echoed eerily through the darkness. She began to wish that she had taken the longer route outside the mountain. She had not realized that the Dragon City would seem so strange and lifeless with all the dragons gone. S Simarine! Simarine jumped. She whirled in the direction of the voice, raising her lamp like a club, and Ali and Aura stepped out of the adjoining tunnel and into the circle of light. In one hand, she clutched a large bucket, three quarters full of soapy water, and she looked rather pale. Alianora, Simmerine said, lowering her arm. What are you doing here? Shh, Alianora said. She looked nervously over her shoulder. Warug told me to scrub off the table in the banquet hall while everyone is away, and I heard someone moving around in there. Even though everyone but us is gone, I dropped my lamp and... Oh my goodness, Simmerine said. The stone prince, I'd forgotten about him. Who? The stone prince. Quickly, Simmerine explained how she had found and hidden him the day before. And I hadn't thought about it until now, but this is the perfect time to get him out of the mountains. She finished. All the dragons are gone and no one will see him. Come on, before I forget again. Alianora nodded dubiously, and the two girls headed for the banquet hall. When they arrived, the Simmerine, Simmerine went in first, holding her lamp high. Prince, she called. Are you there? It's me, Simmerine. Yes, I'm here. The stone prince said, unfolding stiffly from a lump, a gray lump in the corner. I'm glad you're back. Who says that you brought with you? Princess Alianora of the Duchy of Toron Marsh, Simmerine said. She's the princess of the dragon war up just now. Does her father need a great service done for him? Not that I know of, Simmerine replied, unless you're good at getting rid of aunts, but that would be more of a service to Alianora than to her father. I can think of nothing that would make me happier, the prince said with evident admiration as he bowed stiffly to Alianora. Good afternoon, princess, or should it be good evening? It's hard to tell without the windows. Alianora blushed and looked at her bucket without answering. Actually, it's good morning, Simmerine told the prince. 
I'm sorry it took me so long to come back for you, but, uh, well, a lot has been going on. Eleanor looked up sharply. You've been sitting here in the dark all night, she shuddered. You could have at least lit him a candle, Submarine. Thank you for the thought, Princess Eleonora, but it's just as well she didn't, the stone prince said. If I'd been sitting here with a lit candle, they'd have noticed me right away. And an unlit candle isn't much use in the dark, now is it? What do you mean, Submarine said. Who would have noticed you? The dragon and the two men he was talking to, replied the prince. I think that they were wizards. What? said Samarine and Eleonora together. Well, they talked as if they were wizards, the prince said. They weren't carrying staffs, though. What did they look like, Samarine said. They were both tall, and they both had beards. The older one was gray, and the younger ones was brown. Antarell and Semnar, Samarine said. And they were talking to a dragon? The stone prince nodded. Then they wouldn't have been carrying their staffs. Dragons are allergic to them. Did you hear what they said? Something about a contest. The stone prince said. The wizards were going to fix it so that this dragon would win. It sounded kind of like a cross-country race, and the wizards were going to hide along the path and help the dragon out somehow. I'm afraid I'm not very clear about that part. Spells aren't my specialty. I'm much better at hopeless causes. Alianora and Simmerine exchanged appalled glances. The trials with Colin Stone to pick the new king, Alianora said. Which dragon? Simmerine asked urgently. Do you know which dragon? I only heard the name once, the prince said. He sounded apologetic and a little embarrassed. And I don't think I got it right. It's too silly. Tell us, Simmerine commanded. Well, it sounded like Warthog, the prince said, in even more apologetic tones than before. Could it have been Warthog? Simmerine asked. That's it, the prince said. I knew it could have really been Warthog. What a pity you remembered said a voice from the entrance to the banquet hall. Simmerine whirled. Anne Terrell stood in the doorway, staff in hand, watching them with an intolerably smug expression. And that's the end of what we're reading today. Ooh, it's so hard to stop on a cliffhanger, isn't it? The next chapter is called In Which Alianora Discovers an Unexpected Use for Soap and Water, and Simmerine Has Difficulty with a Dragon. We'll read that tomorrow. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library, and I'm reading Dealing with Dragons by Patricia C. Reedy. Um, hope to see you here tomorrow. Bye!